All right, good evening everyone and welcome to Take Charge for December 2014, the last session of the year. So our speaker today is going to be me and I think most of you know me. My name is Rob Bertelink. I'm a cardiac rehab supervisor here at Toronto Rehab. I've actually been here for 22 years and today I'm going to be talking to you about a smattering of topics that are related to the holidays. Okay, so here we go. What are we going to talk about? We're going to try and cover four topics and then field questions as we go through. All right, so we're going to talk about cold weather. We're going to talk a little bit about holiday eating. We're going to talk about holiday stress. And we're going to finish off with one of my favorite topics to talk about, alcohol. Okay, so that's what we're going to cover. We're going to start off with cold weather uh, because I don't know about you guys, but whenever the cold weather comes, that's when I f start thinking about the holidays. I got to put my shorts away, which is heartbreaking. Start wearing the warmer clothes. But the good news is the holidays are, are coming up. So um, in Canada, we need to deal with the extremes of weather. All right, so here's the forecast for 2015 from the good old Farmer's Almanac. Um, I, I didn't break the bank. I didn't spend the $4.95 to actually get the forecast because we know that generally speaking in Toronto, it's going to be a little bit colder. All right. Why is that a concern for us? Well, our body um, operates best when it's at a very, very regular, consistent temperature. If it gets too warm, if it gets too cold, it doesn't work as effectively. So there's a whole bunch of things that our body does when it gets too hot outside, when it gets too cold outside, um, to try and regulate and keep that temperature nice and even. And that's what this thermoregulation is about. All right. So if it starts getting colder than body temperature out, what does our body do to try and maintain that nice even keel, that nice steady temperature? There are a number of things. And many of these things pertain to your heart. So it's important that you know what your body's uh, response to cold weather is so that you can help your heart deal with the cold weather. So as your temperature starts to drop, one of the first things that your body will do is the blood vessels under the, can, under the skin will start to constrict. So what does that mean? That's called peripheral vasoconstriction. Basically what the body does is it doesn't have as much blood go away from the core of the body out to the periphery. And the reason for that is actually pretty simple. We don't have a lot of tissue, a lot of meat out in our hands and at our feet. It's a lot harder to hold on to the temperature. We have a lot more mass in the core of the body, so we try and keep that blood in the core of the body because it's easier to hold on to the heats. Right? What are one of the big consequences of taping um, blood vessels and constricting them down? Your blood pressure starts to go up. Okay? So that's the second point that we have here. It leads to an increase in blood pressure. Um, that's got an impact on your heart because as your blood pressure goes up, your heart needs to do more work. Right? It's, it's actually very easy to calculate how much work your heart's doing at any one time. All you need to do is know what the blood pressure is and how fast it's beating. Heart rate times blood pressure equals what we call a rate pressure product. And that's a measure for how much work your heart's doing. So as the blood pressure goes up, obviously your heart's going to be doing a little bit more work. Okay? Another thing that happens is we've got a, a bundle of nerves here in the back of the throat. And if anything cold hits that bundle of nerves in the back of the throat, it can cause your coronary arteries to start to constrict and spasm a little bit. Now, I know I get this sometimes. When I go out and it's really, really cold and I get that big lung full of air hitting the back of my throat, it feels like my chest is just constricting so much. That's a little bit of coronary artery constriction that you have. I feel that myself. Now imagine if you're somebody with coronary artery disease, you've already maybe got a few narrowings in there. Constriction on top of that is going to make a bad situation um, significantly worse. Okay? So you can see how all of this impacts on your hearts. Now, we always get a lot of people that say, okay, Rob, you know, yeah, I get it. Some people, they don't like the cold, but I'm a true Canadian. I love it when it's cold. I get my hat with my earmuffs and all that stuff, and the cold weather doesn't bother me or in our case, the very cold lecture theater doesn't bother us, right? Um, but it can make a significant difference. And if you take a look down here at the bottom, when they took a look at cold weather and the impact on blood pressure, you'll see that you increase the blood pressure by as much as 27%. That's a pretty big increase. And the reason I point that out is, if your blood pressure is running a little bit high, are you going to feel it? Generally, no. If you've got a blood pressure of 165, 170, 175, 
you're not going to feel anything. You're going to be sitting there, no complaints at all. But your heart's going to be doing an awful lot more work. It's a very real effect. And it's one of these instances where you can't say, well, if I feel great, I'm fine. That's not necessarily the case. Your heart is doing more work when you are outside, okay? It ties into this comment here. If you take a look in that middle slide, but there's a dark side to consider. Numerous studies have shown that death rates peak at this time of year. Blood pressure increases during the winter by some reckoning 70% of the increase in wintertime death can be attributed to the added load on the heart and the cardiovascular system. So it's a very real issue that you need to be aware of. Okay? So this is one of those instances where your mind really does need to overrule how you're feeling in there. Okay? So how do you cope with the added cold weather? Well, this is probably the best way is just make sure that you dress for it. All right, so we go through a full 30, 45 minute talk on managing cold weather in the regular cardiac program, kind of crunching that down. A couple of things that you want to take into consideration. The first one is uh, this comments on layers. The best way to stay warm is to wear multiple layers of clothing. Well, why is that? Um, for every layer of clothing that you wear, it traps a layer of air up against your body and your body temperature will increase that, that, that air that's between your skin and that layer of clothing. And it acts as a layer of insulation. So if I wear two or three or four layers of clothing, I've got two or three or four layers of warmer insulating air keeping me nice and toasty warm. So it does keep you nice and warm. It also makes it an awful lot easier to regulate your body temperature. If you've got all these layers keeping you nice and warm, well, if you just lower the zipper of the first layer, you'll lose some of that warmer air, and that really helps you regulate your body temperature. Like when you're exercising, you go out, you're cold, you want all those layers, everything zipped up. But once you get moving around, you start to generate some heat, you'll start to get too warm. Lowering those zippers, you can regulate your temperature very, very nicely. So wear layers, that's one thing that's very, very important. Um, this polypropylene next to your skin, probably a better way to have put that is don't wear cotton against your skin in the winter. Now, how many people wear cotton year rounds? Yeah, tons of people do. If you struggle to stay warm in the winter, it's the absolute worst thing in the world to wear. And the reason for that is cotton really holds onto moisture quite well. If you're exercising and you perspire even just a little bit, that cotton gets really damp and it sticks to your skin. That causes two problems, okay? The first problem is moisture up against the skin. Moisture wicks heat away from your body very, very quickly. So if you're trying to stay warm and you're wearing anything that's wet, you're gonna get cold very, very quickly. And as everybody knows, if you wear something that's wet up against your skin, cotton, it sticks to your body. There's no insulating air between that wet cotton and your skin. So you lose that insulating layer of, of warm air. So don't wear cotton, okay? Against the body, the other big one is socks. How many people are wearing cotton socks right now? I'm willing to bet almost every single person in this room is probably wearing cotton socks. How many heart patients get cold feet in the winter? Yeah, so cotton socks, if you get cold feet, I mean, it's, it's not a good idea. This polypropylene is a synthetic material that's been around for a while. It's basically a, a synthetic fiber that's, that's hollow. And what it does, it's got some really interesting properties. The key one is it, it wicks moisture away from the body and deposits it into the next layer. So if you wear this synthetic polypropylene up against your skin, it'll keep you, excuse me, it'll keep you very nice and dry. And that's the key to staying warm in the winter is to make sure that you stay dry. So polypropylene is, is a good material. You can buy it in sporting goods stores. You can buy it in Eaton's, Bay, Sears, whatever, Walmart. They have it out there. Um, you can even get um, socks that are made out of these synthetic materials as well. And they go a long way to keeping your feet warm, especially if you're a heart patient on beta blockers in the winter, which covers a lot of people, okay? Um, we lose a lot of heat through their head. And the reason for that is there's not a lot of tissue up here and we have to have steady blood flow through your head. So make sure that you keep your head nice and warm. Once again, a cotton hat is a bad idea. It's gonna turn into a block of ice and you're just gonna lose the heat very, very quickly. All right? So the synthetic dry weave fibers are really, really great. Um, some other natural fibers that have got the same property, wool. Wool is fantastic. It does not retain moisture. It'll take it through, dump it into the next layer, but it's scratchy. 
I've yet to meet anybody that wears a wool sweater up against the skin, but wool works. Um, what a lot of the staff will do here when they go running, they'll get these polypropylene socks and then they'll put a big wool sock over top. Beautiful way to keep your feet nice and toasty warm, okay? Um, with the mouth, the reason we put that there is remember the cold air hitting the back of the throat and causing all that constriction in the chest. If you can cover your mouth, you prevent the cold air from hitting the back of your throat and it really does make a big difference. So I always tell all of my patients in the winter, carry a scarf. And even if it's just around your, uh, around your shoulders, that's fine. But when you head outside and it's cold, just block your nose and your mouth on the way to the car. It makes a world of difference. And you know, carrying a scarf around is not a big deal, okay? So that works with uh, the, the clothing. That's the big thing that you can do to really help your body out, okay? Of course, it's only gonna go to a point, all right? Um, the recommendation that we always push is once the temperature gets down to minus 10 degrees Celsius with the wind chill factored into it, the stress of dealing with the cold combined with the stress of exercise together is probably more than your heart should be looking to deal with, right? And that's with the wind chill. So if it's minus five, feels like minus 15, we encourage our patients not to do their exercise outside. Okay, by all means, if you need to go out, go outside. Just don't stress your heart out and exercise in really cold weather, okay? And remember, that's pretty much for everybody because a big part of the load on your heart is blood pressure, which doesn't cause any symptoms. Okay, so do keep that in mind. All right. Um, snow shoveling, I had all these wonderful slides all about snow shoveling. They all said the same thing. Snow shoveling kills people. Plain, plain and simple. Um, this was an American uh, uh, report that came out. 7% of heart patients at Canadian hospitals said symptoms started while clearing snow. Another quote that we always throw out there is if you take a look at what day of the year has got more admissions to the hospital than any other day of the year, you want to hazard a guess? First, first snowfall of the year. And the reason is, generally speaking, it's cold. And you know the effect that has on your cardiovascular system, especially increasing the blood pressure. Shoveling snow, it's hard work, all right? Shoveling wet snow with a, a wider shovel requires the same amount of oxygen as doing a six minute mile. Really, really tough work. Does anybody ever warm up before they shovel snow? No, you just go out there, throw in a coat, grab the shovel and start shoveling. You guys know how important warm up is before exercise, but nobody warms up before they go out and shovel snow. So it really creates, you know, a, a real perfect situation for getting yourself into a lot of trouble. And it's why when cardiologists say right off the bat, don't ever shovel snow, I actually agree with them on that. You should never shovel snow. You really need to avoid it. Um, there's a service in Toronto, if you're over 65 years of age or you're a cardiac patient, where they will come and actually help with your snow removal. So if you dial 311 and say, hey, listen, I'm a heart patient, I'm a senior, what do you have to help with snow removal? They have programs across all of Toronto for that. Take advantage of it, okay? Uh, the best option for dealing with the cold <laughs> is this one, right? Just pack up, go south, life is fantastic. You don't have to deal with the cold weather at all. That's where I'm hoping to be in the next little while, someplace on a beach. Questions with the cold weather? Yeah. Emil. So, again, uh, on shoveling, if you don't really shovel, but sort of just push the snow. Yes. Uh, is, that, uh, is that less stressful? So if you absolutely have to shovel, how should you go about doing it? So there, there's a bunch of things that you can do. So the first one is, uh, make sure that you dress properly. Realizing that if you can defray the cold weather and the blood pressure that's going to help your heart out, make sure you dress properly. Make sure you warm up. Because if you're going to go out there and do a little bit of a warm up, the key thing that's going to do is that's going to dilate the coronary arteries and it's going to bring more oxygen rich blood to the heart so you're able to handle that work. And also remember, cold air hitting the back of the throat actually constricts your arteries. So that offsets that to a degree. Then if you're going to go out there and shovel, don't go out and buy the biggest shovel you can find. Because a big, massive shovel, it, it weighs a lot more. It's way more work. So grab a small shovel. Make sure that it's a shovel that's, that's fairly slippery, all right? If you have one and the snow starts sticking to it every time you shovel, it gets harder and harder. I had one patient say, just grab a can of Pam and spray it on the shovel before you use it so stuff slides off, okay? 
when you go and do the work, your leg muscles are way stronger than your upper body. So try and do most of the work by putting the shovel up against your stomach or your hips and just walking and pushing it a little bit. Make your legs do the work. And then also check your heart rate. Okay, most of you guys have got a pretty good feel for what your heart rate's supposed to be while you're exercising. You know that that's a safe number for you to get. If you're out shoveling snow and you keep your heart rate below that, you're probably gonna be reasonably okay. Remember that shoveling snow, your blood pressure will be higher. So even if you have the same heart rate, your heart's doing more work. But as long as you're close, you're okay. Take breaks. You, know, you don't have to shovel snow for an hour straight. Go five minutes, stop and rest for a little bit. Check your heart rate, calm down, relax. Do those kind of things and it'll go a long way to making it safer. But do realize it's a high risk activity. Okay, it is a high risk activity. And as long as you keep that in mind that you're doing something dangerous, I'm gonna be extra cautious. That's the, the kind of approach you want to take if you have to shovel snow. How about a snowblower? How about a snowblower? So snowblowers are pretty good as well. Um, the two things that you want to make sure is that they're self-propelling. So you don't want to get a snow shoveler while all you're doing is pushing because that's going to be hard work as well. And interestingly, we did some research 15-ish years ago taking a look at using snowblowers to get rid of snow. We had a bunch of patients come in, we hooked them up to telemetry, we turned them loose, they cleared our sidewalks for us, it was great. And then we looked at the cardiogram to see what happened. You wanna know where all the problems were? Starting the snow blowers. So make sure that it's well maintained. Cause if you get the snow blower that's got one of these rip cords on it and you gotta pull it 40, 50 times, that's when we saw all the arrhythmia. So if it's an electric start, or you have it very, very well maintained, then you're gonna be okay. Self-propelled, stay behind it. Still make sure you dress warm and everything, but then you're gonna be much, much better off. Absolutely. So if you go out in the morning and it's really cold and then you warm up later, is there gonna be a problem with that? Generally speaking, even though there can be a significant change between 8 a.m. at lunch, that's a change that's over hours. That's not gonna be a problem. Um, it would be a worry as if it was ice cold and you went and you know jumped into a sauna right away or if you went from a sauna you jumped into an ice cold lake it's that sudden change that's a real shock to the body that is the kind of thing i would really discourage but if you just get a, a change of temperature throughout the day generally that's happening over hours and your body can acclimatize to that so you'd be okay with that okay good cold weather so holiday eating big issue for a lot of people so initially I thought, okay, I'm going to talk about holiday eating. I'm going to throw out all this information about calories and all these big, thick, rich drinks. The amount of calories that you get in all this lovely chocolate and, you know, all the fattening foods. And you see so much of that over the holidays. I was going to quote this study that's been around for about 14 years now, a prospective study of holiday weight gain where they actually took a look at the amount of weight the typical American gains over the holidays. And that was actually related to weight gain throughout somebody's entire life, the, the calories you put on here. But then I thought, you guys heard all this, all right? We've heard our dietitians speak time and time again. Um, I don't wanna say that eating well is not rocket science, but you guys know the basics of eating well. All right, I, I don't need to go and quote calories. You guys know that there's a lot of calories in drink. You guys know if you have a big box of chocolates for dinner, that's probably not a good idea, all right? So I thought I'd, I'd change my tact a little bit and I'd, I'd get away from the calories and I, I talked to our dietitian Marie and I said, listen, I don't wanna be a Scrooge and belabor. Don't eat this, don't eat that, don't do this kind of stuff. What should I talk about? And she said, you know, Rob, People are smart, so just talk to them about this practice intuitive eating, right? Don't just eat the stuff because it's there, all right? We know that it's, it's the holidays. We know that there's tons of really, really good food about, and there's nothing wrong with eating it. But as our very first dietitian in the program said back in 1993, Fran Burkhoff, wonderful lady, she said, moderation is the key. You can eat anything you want, just eat it in moderation. Right? So Maria had a couple of points here. Listen to your body. Recognize the difference between physical hunger, hunger and emotional hunger. You know, there's a lot of people that have stress over the holidays um, and they end up just eating because it's there. I know Alex was standing here with me and we were looking at the slides. He said, that's bad for me. I'll stand beside the snack table and I'm just doing this. And I don't even know what I'm doing, right? So just be aware, whatever you put in your mouth, why are you eating it? 
And if you ask your question before anything you eat, why am I eating this? It'll go a long ways because you will start cutting back on the amount of stuff that you eat. You will enjoy it that much more, okay? Um, do realize that the, a lot of these things will help erode your control and your ability to think. Alcohol, being tired and stressed, right? That's going to cut down your will. But if you can just remember over the holidays this one thing. Anytime you eat something, ask yourself before you eat it, why am I eating this? Am I hungry? Do I want to eat eight of these chocolates and really hate myself when I get home because I've done that? And we're all there, right? We've all done that. We've eaten stuff and hated ourselves for eating it later. So before you eat it, just ask yourself, why am I eating this? Okay. Um, and that, go, that goes to point two. Instead of fearing food, enjoy it because it's going to be there. Right? Enjoy it. Take advantage of it. Um, try and stick to your regular routine. I can never stress that enough. My mom is, bless her heart, is, is horrible for this. She's going out to a party, so what does she do? She skips breakfast and lunch, so she frees up room to go out for dinner, right? <laughs> Worst thing in the world. Because then she's going to get there, and she's starving. And you know she's filling up with all the bad foods. It's all the, the high-calorie stuff that she needs to avoid. So have your re meals as you regularly do, and then when you go out, try and eat as, as sensibly as you can, okay? Be mindful of how you want to feel in your body after the meal. That's got Maria Recupero written all over it. She's a, a big fan of that. And that's why, I, I mean, for me, when, when we chatted about this, the, the thing that really resonated is just think before you eat, okay? That's not to say there aren't some little tips and strategies that you can share, okay? Um, if you're going out and you're worried that you're going to not eat well, maybe it's a party. If you normally eat dinner at 5 and you know this is going to be a little bit later, have a healthy snack before you go. So instead of getting there hungry, having to eat on all the snacks and hors d'oeuvres and then have to have a full meal afterwards, have the, a healthy snack before you go out. Right? That'll go a long way. Um, bring that healthy snack with you. Okay? There's nothing that says when you go out it's always got to be a big box of chocolates or something like that. You know, bring a crate of mandarin oranges. Bring a fruit and veggie tray. That way at least you know there's going to be something there that's healthy for you to snack on. All right? So you can bring that kind of stuff. Uh, my favorite, increase your activity patterns to burn a few more calories. All right? uh, one, one of the things that a lot of people struggle with is trying to exercise through the winter. You know, it's cold, there's snow, it's icy, all this kind of stuff is a little bit of a problem. Um, but exercise really does go a long ways to burning a few more calories. So if you know you're going to maybe eat a little bit more rich food, which is fine, see if you can walk a little bit more to offset that. Okay, so that's another one as well. I mentioned this think before you eat. I can never mention that enough. Okay, and celebrate the positives instead of dwelling on the negatives. So that's the kind of thing where you go, and if maybe one day, uh, you end up eating carrot sticks instead of having a box of chocolates, really be happy that you managed to accomplish that. Okay? Maybe the, the dinner didn't go as well it is, as, as it could have, but don't beat yourself up over the negatives associated with the food. Really focus on the victories and enjoy those positives. You want to feel good about yourself. right? That's, that's our big goal. All right? And then vegetables, vegetables, vegetables. I had a neat graphic that I was going to throw up here, and it was a picture of a stomach. And it showed 400 calories of oil. And it was like maybe the bottom 10% of the stomach was full. And then it was 400 calories of, of fat. It was about half the, the stomach was full. And then it was 400 calories of vegetables. And I mean, the stomach was just like full and overflowing type thing, right? You feel a lot fuller with the vegetables than any of the other things. So focus on the vegetables. You can never, ever go wrong with vegetables, okay? The questions with the food. We've heard Maria a number of times. She's fantastic. So I just kind of trust through that one. Okay. Holiday stress. I love this graphic. It's fantastic. So for hopefully everybody, the holidays are the graphic on the slide. It's time to meet with friends and family. Enjoy yourself. Have some good foods. Maybe relax. Enjoy yourself. See people you haven't seen in a while. And it's a really good time, okay? But for many people, it's the, the graphic on the left, right? It's, oh my God, how many pounds am I going to put on over the holidays? How am I going to pay for all these bills? I've got everyone screaming for this, that, my time. I've got to clean the house a thousand times a day, it feels like. So for a lot of people, there's a great deal of stress, 
okay? I think everybody knows that, that stress is bad for you. Um, it's, it's one of the stronger risk factors that lead to the con uh, development of coronary artery disease. It's one of the stronger risk factors that's gonna cause you to have a heart attack. So stress is, is really, really bad. Sorry, uncontrolled stress, unmanaged stress is really, really bad for you. I don't think that comes as a surprise at all. Um, why is that? Anytime our body is exposed to stress, our body produces stress hormones. Okay, and the, the, probably the most popular stress hormone that we've all heard of is adrenaline. Okay, so whether we have an acutely stressful event, you're driving home today after the session, you, you come up to a stop sign and you slide through, you almost get into an accident, it feels like your heart's gonna bound out of your chest. We, we've, we've all had that. That's obviously acutely stressful. You have this big surge of adrenaline and you feel that, okay? Chronic stress does the same thing, but maybe not as pronounced. Worrying about paying those bills, the health, your weights, and all those things, that's a chronic stress as well. Both of them produce adrenaline, and adrenaline creates this whole big melting pot of negative things for your body, and it really creates a toxic soup for your body to live in. So if you're exposed to stress, your blood sugars would be elevated. And for anybody who's a diabetic in the group, you probably remember if you get sick, which is a stress on your body, a lot of the time your blood sugars are running higher than they normally are. It's because of the stress of being sick. Um, adrenaline increases your blood pressure. Everybody knows that blood pressure is a risk factor for heart disease, number one risk factor for stroke, okay? Blood pressure increases your heart rate. We don't want your heart rate elevated all the time, okay? We want it to be nice and low and relaxed so it's not doing a lot of work. That's why we give so many of our heart patients beta blockers. They calm your heart down, they slow the heart rate down so it's not doing a lot of work. Stress does the opposite, okay? Um, adrenaline also increases your blood cholesterol. So you end up with more circulating fat through your body as well. It makes your blood a little bit thick and pasty. Okay? This is what we call the fight or flight response. It's been in mankind since the dawn of time. It was very, very useful back in caveman days because back then, whenever we got stressed as a caveman, it was like a life and death situation. You had to fight for your life or run for your life, okay? Almost always required a physical response. The reason why stress is so bad in modern times is largely because we're sedentary society, all right? We've got all these stressors building up, but we don't do anything to manage the stress. So this toxic soup builds up day after day after day after day until eventually something's going to snap. And that's when you have your heart attack. So managing the stress is very important, especially if you got extra stress through the holidays. You want to make sure that you get that under control. Okay? So how to do that? Well, exercise, of course, is, is one of the biggest things that you can do. All right, so in the short term, exercise undoes a lot of the bad things that the stress hormones will do for your body. All right. So after exercise, when you're exercising, your blood pressure goes up. When you stop exercise, your blood pressure comes down and it often goes down lower than what your resting value is. It's something that we call post-exercise hypotension. And your blood pressure will be lower than rest for at least four, five, six hours. So that's fantastic. Blood pressure goes up by stress. Go out and exercise, blood pressure will come down nicely. Okay. Um, Heart rate goes up with exercise as well. When we finish uh, the exercise, the heart rate comes back down to resting value, so that's good. When we're exercising, we need some kind of fuel source. So if you've got extra fat floating around in your system, like the cholesterol or the sugar, which we use as fuel source, exercise burns those things up really, really nicely. And we all know exercise lowers your blood cholesterol. And diabetics know if you go out and exercise, it drops your blood sugar quite nicely too. Okay? And exercise also thins your blood. So stress will make it a little thicker and pasty. Exercise will thin that. So one of the things I always tell my people, if, if you've had a stressful day at the office or because of the holidays or whatever, one of the best things that you can go and do is at the end of the day, go out for a walk. Because all this toxic stuff, this toxic crap that builds up in your body because of stress, if you go out and exercise, you'll burn it all off. And then when you go to sleep, you sleep for six, eight hours, at least you've got that period of sleep where your body can truly be relaxed, can take a break from the stress of day-to-day -day living, okay? Versus exercising in the morning. The exercise is still good, but if you exercise in the morning, 
you burn all this stuff off, but the second you get back in the door, it starts building up again. So you don't have as much of that downtime. So going out for a walk after dinner in the evening, not a hard exercise session, just a walk, really goes a long way to helping uh, keep the stress under control. All right? Exercise on a regular basis also goes a long way to helping your body cope with stress chronically. Okay? This is a slide from a study that was done a while ago where they measured circulating stress hormones in the body. And what they found is that after 12 weeks of regular exercise, on average, people who exercise regularly had 50% less circulating stress hormones than non-exercisers. Right? So going into the holidays, if you've been exercising on a regular basis, you're going into those holidays in a better place than non-exercisers because you're already protected. Okay? So absolutely fantastic. Exercise is um, not the only way to manage stress. There's lots of other ways that have been proven to be effective as well. Meditation, visualization, deep breathing, prayer. There's a whole big long list of things that manage your stress. Um, if you can't exercise, if you can just go and sit in a quiet room, do some deep breathing for a while. That goes a long way to offset it as well. Okay? And then just uh, a, a nice smattering of other things to keep in mind. Get plenty of uh, sleep, all right? If you're sleep deprived all the time, that's gonna lower your immune system. It's gonna make the stress that much worse, all right? Continue to exercise, as I said. Um, learn to say no, right? They actually, for professionals now out uh, that are still working, they offer courses on how to say no, all right? And it's the kind of thing, the boss comes and asks for something. Yes, you don't wanna upset the boss, but you really need to know when you've, when you've doing everything that you can and you've got no more time and your health starts suffering. So saying no is important. Um, keeping a journal. This is one that a lot of people chuck at, chuckle at, com coming from me, I guess. Um, at the end of the holidays, if you really struggle to get through the holidays and there's been a lot of stress, one of the things that's a good thing to do is take a sheet of paper and just write down how you felt going through the holidays in 2014. What really bothered you? What was really stressing you out? What would you have done differently? Put it aside and then in December of next year, Pull it out and read it because I guarantee if you have a stressful holiday this season, by the time it rolls around for next season, you've forgotten everything. You really have. So put it down in paper and then just before next year starts, break it out, take a look at it, and then hopefully you won't make the same mistakes twice. Okay? Pace yourself. Stay flexible. Volunteering is always a, a good one because I, I know a lot of people, they get all stressed out. They're thinking, oh, it's, it's horrible. It's bad. It's miserable. When you volunteer with some, of the, some other people and they're truly down and out and they've got health problems and stuff like that, I can pretty much guarantee it doesn't matter who you are, we can find people that are worse off. And sometimes volunteering, um, you, you know, that, that point, it's kind of driven home a little bit. And it also makes you feel better about yourself when you're helping other people. Okay? And do look out for number one. We get a lot of people that are looking after sick relatives, family, and all this kind of stuff. It's not going to do them any good if you stress yourself into the point where you're sick and you get yourself into health troubles. So do make sure you look after yourself. That's very important too. Okay? Questions about stress? No stress. I've stressed Leslie out. She's leaving in the back. I'm just going to put the apple cider on. Oh, so not yes. The warm apple cider will be wonderful. We like Leslie. She's wonderful. She really is. All right. Alcohol. Point number four. All right. So, um, survey time. And everybody needs to chime in with us. Alcohol is good. Okay. Alcohol is bad. Kit, you can't sit on the fence. So, alcohol is bad? For you, it's bad. For everybody else, it's good. We don't know. Okay. So th this is kind of um, a tricky one. And I won't lie to you, this seems to flip-flop all over the place. All right? So a, a couple of, a couple of uh, studies that I just want to point out. So this is one that just came out in the summer. And I'm not sure if you guys saw this in the news. Um, if you read the conclusion, um, these findings indicate that alcohol consumption, even at moderate intakes, is a risk factor for something called atrial fibrillation. So this was a study that went and took a look and it said, okay, um, does alcohol contribute to atrial fibrillation? They said, yes, pretty much any amount of alcohol is gonna contribute to atrial fibrillation. So 
For those of, that, of you that don't know, atrial fibrillation is a situation where the top part of the heart just twitches. Normally you have one electrical impulse that passes over the atria, it's picked up in the middle of the heart in the AV node, and then it's transmitted over the ventricles. So one electrical impulse, atria contract, one electrical impulse, ventricles contract. In atrial fibrillation, you get dozens and dozens of electrical signals, and the top part of the heart just kind of twitches away, okay? Um, it can cause a number of problems. It can cause your heart to get very tired and fatigued, and you can develop something called heart failure. The other consequence of atrial fibrillation is the blood in the top part of your heart doesn't get squeezed out very well, and it can start to pool and form blood clots, and atrial fibrillation can lead to strokes. Right? So it's not a great thing. There's also something that's very apropos for this called holiday heart syndrome. And this is a situation where you see people going into the eMERGE in atrial fibrillation. And then you go and you ask them and you say, well, what were you doing within the last 12 hours? What's the common feature all these people are doing? Drinking booze, all right? I'm one of those guys. I can't drink anymore because if I do more than two or three glasses in an hour, I develop atrial fibrillation, all right? So we look at this and Kit, we say, booze bad, right? Not good, we should avoid it, a absolutely. Okay, so this is this interheart study. It was a similar slide that I had up when we talked about stress. Um, this is a really big study that took a look at risk factors across the entire, uh, across the entire world. Many, many different populations, hundreds of thousands of people in there. They took a look at it um, in, in a significant degree. And that first circle, it says alcohol intake, and then I circled the wrong column. If we go into the one that's odd ratio, you'll see it's 0.79. Um, People that drink alcohol on a moderate level are 21% less likely to have a heart attack. So what do you think, Kit? Alcohol's good now, right? <laughs> Whatever at this point, right? So this is one where they're, they're thinking that alcohol is cardioprotective, all right? Um, it increases your HDL, the good cholesterol, which is cardioprotective. Um, and this actually showed that it decreases your risk of having heart attacks, right? And this is one that we've, we've heard a fair bit over the years. And then there's this, this next one just kind of muddies the waters even more. If you take a look at the very last line, our study suggests that alcohol reduction should be recommended as an important component of lifestyle modica modification for the prevention treatment of hypertension among heavy drinkers. So one of the things that we say from a lifestyle point of view, if you come up to me and say, Rob, my blood pressure's running a little bit high. I really don't want to take too many drugs to get it under control. What can I do from a lifestyle point of view? One of the things that we tell you is to avoid alcohol because alcohol consumption is associated with high blood pressure. So now we're looking alcohol bad. Last one to throw it in here, and this is a big problem in, uh, in North America. North Americans are heavy. By and large, most of us are overweight, right? So when you take a look here, caloric content, alcohol is really, really calorie dense. And when you're drinking alcohol, there's no vitamins, minerals, nutrients, or any good stuff. It's just pure calories. There's nothing beneficial in there at all. Um, and just to kind of give you an idea in terms of the caloric content, um, that comment underneath, 150 pound person burns 109 calories for every mile they walk. So when I mean, you have a beer, you're gonna walk a mile and a half just to break even, all right? It's, it's pretty calorie dense. And if you're trying to manage your weight, this, excuse me, is, is not helping the situation. So where, where do we sit with alcohol? Um, a definite maybe. Th this one's gone up and down for, for, for many, many years. Um, you take a look at heart and stroke, and they're even a little bit on the fence as well. In that second paragraph, there's a comment that says, however, if you really want to have an impact on your heart health, you're better off eating a healthy diet, being physically active by doing exercise, becoming smoke-free, all right? A few years ago, the heart and stroke came out with a very strong statement that said, no healthcare provider shall advocate the consumption of alcohol for health benefits. It was big black letters with a lot of underlines. They've changed their stance a little bit, but in looking at this, they're really not advocating uh, alcohol consumption is a good thing. They do go on to say that if you do drink alcohol, I heard someone say mo moderation is what you want to be looking to do. So this is the definition of, of moderation. 
all right? For the ladies, two drinks a day to a limit of 10 throughout the week. Uh, for the men, it's three drinks a day to a maximum of 15, okay? Um, what is a drink? That was on this slide here, right? 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of wine, ounce of hard liquor, that's, that's considered a drink, okay? Um, and you don't want to binge, all right? Stuart, we're not going to go out on Friday and drink our 15 drinks on Friday night. We can't do that, okay? That, that's really bad. You, you do want to make sure you spread them out. Don't have more than uh, four drinks on a single occasion. It takes your body about an hour uh, to break down one drink, all right? So just to give you an idea, four drinks, you're looking four hours just for your body to break that down, okay? So keep an eye on the alcohol, all right? So I, I put this one up here because I loved it. And, you know, when I was putting this talk together, I thought, I, I, I don't want to spoil the holidays for anybody. All right, the holidays are supposed to be a good time, an awful lot of fun. So I'm really hoping I'm not this guy, okay? Um, I'm really kind of hoping that we can finish this and have more of the happy holiday theme, all right, and really enjoy things, okay? So thank you very much.